Morning, Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. Well, I'm back today, the 23rd of July 2022, because I've just had a, something come through, a message that has warmed my heart and makes all that I do worthwhile. Now, it's come through from someone called Frankie, okay, and I'm not sure if it's the same Frank from Dublin who came on my live a few weeks ago, an absolute gentleman, says that him and his wife listen to my podcast every day, every episode, and when they go to bed at night, they have it on, on the radio, they can drift off to sleep and listen to our hostage. A real gentleman, do you know, and they're the kind of people that I do this for. You know, and Frank from Dublin, right, is my number one, number one listener. Now, it's just come through, right? Frankie commented, Art, can you wish my wife, Paula Kane, happy birthday? She is 50 years young today. We are together 33 years. We love your show. All the best from Dublin, Ireland. Okay, well, if it's my, if it's my Frank from Dublin who came on the live with me, you know, brilliant, yeah. If it's not, right, no problem. Another Frankie from Dublin. Well, Paula Kane. I want to wish you a wonderful happy birthday today and congratulate you and Frank on being together for 33 years. Okay, thank you very much for listening, right? And comments like that, honestly, make it all worthwhile. Yeah, they really do. So thank you very much for that. Okay, yeah, let's not forget forget Frank from Dublin right he's my number one listener him and his wife they listen to my show every night when, when they drift off to sleep bless them but anyway right happy birthday Paula Kane okay she's I'm not going to say her age right because you're only as old as the man you feel <laughs> right they've been together for 33 glorious years and good luck to you okay so now we got that out of the way, right? Another story's dropped, and I want to um, read it to you, right? And what I want to explain to people who say, oh, well, Art Hosses, you just read the articles. Well, people like that. You know, people haven't got time to go and find articles and things. It's like on my Twitter. I drop articles from all over the world. And people come there to, to look at the articles that I'm referring to. And also, they listen to me reading the articles and then my take on it, my spin on it, you know, it's, that's all I'm doing. And an article is just dropped, right, in Der Spiegel, right, in Germany. Okay. It's about the Panama Papers. Okay. It's the first time, okay, the first interview with the Panama Papers whistleblower. Okay. And I'm going to read it to you, all right, in a minute. But first of all, we just do a little bit of Kinahan thing, right? Um, a couple of weeks ago, okay, there was a load that was seized in Antwerp. Cartels are smuggling elephant-sized loads of cocaine to Antwerp. Belgian and Dutch police announced on Wednesday that nearly six metric tons of cocaine hidden in a shipping container of rice from Paraguay was intercepted in the port of Antwerp last month. The bust highlights the port of ports of Belgium and Holland as critical byways for industrial scale smuggling of cocaine into Europe, which became the world's biggest single market for the drug in 2020. Yeah, read that and weep. Okay, Europe is the world's biggest single market for cocaine as of 2020 with Antwerp believed to be the single busiest entry point for cocaine smugglers. Wholesale, that cargo, could be worth 145 million US dollars. On the streets, it could have fetched at least four times as much. The explosion in the size of the shipments being sent over the past five years has stunned investigators in Holland and Belgium who fear the economically critical ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp, two of Europe's largest and busiest, are physically unable to stem the flow of drugs. 
South American cartels working with European gangs, the Kinhans and, uh, and others, John Cunningham, Georgia Penguin Mitchell, shh, have completely reinvented the global supply chain. Cocaine is relatively cheap to make, but it sells for a lot. That makes it easy to risk losing whole containers full of it. Police estimate they, they are stopping just 10% of the shipments. There you go. See, I've been saying it for years. Right, there was estimates, and it works throughout criminality. Okay. With stolen art, it's less than 10%. It's 1% or 2%, and sometimes even less than that. But then when you go up into museum quality iconic works worth tens of millions, it's about 5% and maybe 10% because at some stage there are negotiations to hand back. And over the years, people have been caught in stings, but they won't be caught in stings anymore. But not if I've got anything to do with it. You know what I mean? You know, I have thwarted hundreds of art recoveries from both sides where cheating was going on. So I just told the truth to everyone, and then they all walked away. But there we got it again. Police estimate they are stopping 10% of shipments. It's been like that for decades, so it's nothing new. But when they used to say discover 100 kilos of cocaine, that meant 900 kilos were getting through. When they would discover a tonne of cocaine, that meant that nine tonnes were getting through. So now they've just seized, what's this one? Six tonnes. So that means 53 tonnes have got through, if you're working on the ratio of 10 to 1. Ten years ago, 5,700 kilos of cocaine would have been the world record, and even a shipment one-tenth of that size would be considered massive. According to Paul, a retired Belgian police official who now consults for clients at Antwerp Port, but the now, but now the record is 23 metric tons. Last year, Antwerp intercepted 90 tons, and Rotterdam about 60 tons total. And that cartels are confident enough to pack almost six tons into a container gives us every sign that they are not worried about customs. The entire load, according to Paul and other investigators interviewed by Gateway would not have been destined for a single customer or cartel because no one group has the ability to process and distribute so much cocaine in one go. Well, I would disagree. Right, and, and from the criminal perspective, what they've got is they've got what's called um, the 18-month window. It used to be nine months. It's now 18-month window, which meant, let's just say tomorrow... Sunday, the 24th of July, every single, right, no more cocaine was sent from South America, no more drugs were sent from anywhere around the world. Everything came to a stop. Okay, so there was nothing coming out of South America, nothing coming out of Asia, no, nothing, right? The cartels have already got enough for the next 18 months. So they could supply the market for the next 18 months if there was ever a drought. If ever all producers in, uh, in South America just said, we're going on strike or we're not sending any more cocaine to Europe, N nothing. Well, the cartels have been building up so much reserves, okay, that they can go on for 18 months. It's on the same parallel as what you get the strategic re reserves of gasoline, the strategic reserves of oil that countries have. The US has it. All the countries have it. So if, if ever they turn the tap off, you've got, well, they normally work, I think they've got three months. But so much cocaine has been produced that the cartels have now got 18 months reserves. So they don't mind. Well, they do mind. Of course they mind when they, when they lose any load, but it's worked on the 10 to 1 basis. This is why we see such large single loads. Now, it's not 40 kilos to a single gang to wholesale or sell. There could be a dozen or more cartels in, involved in a load this size, said Paul. If there's one factor 
that has led to the rise of such huge busts. It's the willingness of cartels to cooperate in movements like this to move huge amounts of drugs. In the past, cartels avoided cooperation on train shipments, but since 2015, uh-uh, Kinahan's went to Dubai, working, right, you know, I mean, hand in glove with MI6 and the MI6 station there. That's, that's what it's all about. I'll tell you about the whole master plan, right? I'll do an episode on the master plan, what they wanted to do and what they're continuing to do. Anyway, in the past, cartels avoided cooperation on train shipments, but since 2015, there has been a rise of new cartels and ways of working. The increasingly open markets around Europe open the way for cartels to cooperate and command even better prices because of the larger, larger shipments. And while hundreds of the kilos were likely destined for larger gangs, there's opportunities for very small dealers to get in on the action by investing themselves. That sounds like the sales pitch, doesn't it? It sounds like the sales pitch. You know, drugs are us. Incorporated, right? You know what I mean? They're looking for small investors. Mum and pop, mom and pop investors in the drug cartel. So you can all buy a little drop of the 10 tonnes of cocaine, right, shipment. <laughs> so well, you can go down to Antwerp and say, hello, yeah, here's my bit of paper. Yeah, I want three kilos of cocaine, please. I'm a small investor. <laughs> Honestly, we're getting that, we're getting, it's getting that way, isn't it? And while hundreds of the kilos were likely destined for the larger gangs, there's opportunities for very small-time dealers mum and pop, <laughs> to get in on the action by investing themselves. Even an entrepreneurial low-level trafficker can get in on the action by saving up to €25,000 to reserve a kilo as part of a syndicate of buyers, my sources, my sources say. Honestly, I'm on the floor roaring. I'm roaring with laughter. Right, have you ever heard anything like it, right? An entrepreneurial, low-level trafficker can get in on the act by saving up to €25,000 to reserve a kilo as part of a syndicate of buyers. How about that? Yeah. See, but now you've got the Kinahans, right? It's coming out, right? And the more they're trying to give the Kinahans cover by saying there's sanctions and rewards and we're on the case, right? You're just throwing the spotlight more and more on the fact that the Kinahans are sitting down with their MI6 handlers and the MI6 station chief in Dubai, okay, and they're handing out low um, busts to authorities around the world, right, like Smarties, right, like confetti, like bus tickets, okay, and that is the price of their freedom to continue. And they're also taking down rivals. They're also providing intelligence on terrorism in the Middle East, on terrorist, terrorist financing, money laundering, Hezbollah, Iran, weapons dealing, and all of those carrying on. Okay, and this really is Operation Shovel from 2009 on steroids. Okay, and if you want a historic case, because you know I like to be able to have a historic case to, to pin my colours to, to say I'm saying this now because look what happened on this historic case. I tell you all to go and read the story of Barry Seal. Barry Seal, B-A-R-R-Y-S-E-A-L. Barry Seal, drug smuggler. You can pull it up on Wikipedia and it gives you a good outline and there's loads of articles on Barry Seal. Okay, he was a drug smuggler and then he started working for the DEA and he and he, he took down loads of drug barons all around the world. Prime ministers, all kinds of people. And then when he got busted and he appeared in court, there was a conspiracy because he got involved in espionage and all that game where he was hung out to dry and then he was allegedly murdered by the cartel. But there were a lot of important political people who had a lot to lose if Barry Seal spilled the beans. And that's the kind of game the Kinahans are playing now. Okay. All the time that they're handing out busts like this one, six metric tons, ten tons, all the time they're handing in other drug 
barons, you know, from all kinds of people. Louis Edwards, Moonan, Otinel, the latest one in um, in Mexico. Okay, all, you know, all the time they're doing that. Yeah, that's great. And all the time, you know, weapons loads and espionage on, on Iran and Hezbollah and all this sort of carry on. Yeah, fine. But at some stage, right, the decision has to be made. Do they go into witness protection and start testifying against a load of people or just disappear into witness protection? Because this time, right, like Operation Shovel in Spain, the same thing happened. They sat down and grasped everyone up all around the world. And in the end, right, they said that the trial collapsed because it was too confusing. You ever heard that one? A huge trial like that. Like, yeah, it's too confusing. They had so many companies, we didn't know where... Um, our arse from our elbow, we didn't know from one end to the other, really. No, it wasn't. It was because they cooperated. And when they got out of the operation shovel, they moved their operations to Dubai under the uh, mentorship of um, MI6 and the MI6 station. And their links to MI6 go back many decades. Christy Kinnahan Sr., right? I think he was born in the UK. But the connections to MI6 go back Right, um, decades. Okay, and then in the shadows, you've got John Cunningham and you've got George the Penguin Mitchell. Again, right, you know, players that are very, very quiet, you know, and whether they've allowed Daniel to stick himself up like Icarus with his photograph of all celebrities, right, letting him take the rap and letting him take the heat and keeping themselves in the shadows. Well, if that was their intention, well, then it's worked. If it wasn't their intention, it's then bought the spotlight on everything. And someone said John Cunningham's now in Dubai. Last I heard, he was in Spain. The last bit you can find on the internet about John Cunningham was when he attended a funeral with a relative in um, 2015. Was it his brother or someone? And George the Penguin Mitchell, there's no trace of him. Well, he's got a lot of them IT geeks, super hackers, right, on his side. You know what I mean? The servers, there's the story about the German server. The only photograph you've got is of him laying on the couch eating popcorn or something that's about 30 years old. But again, in some respects, though, to be fair, right, if we are going to accept that drug dealing is going to go on and that we're not going to be able to stop it, the lesser of all the evils, to be honest, over all the years, John Cunningham and George the Penguin Mitchell, okay, they're quiet, in the shadows. Yes, and we know all the fallout from drugs and all this carry on, but if we know that's going to happen anyway, my point has always been we don't want to know who them people in the shadows are. We don't want to see them. Like John Gotti, right? Like um, Daniel Kinahan, right? You know, we don't want to see, you know, the public don't want it, be, you know, don't want it to be known and have it rammed down their throat that these are the people that are dealing in death, destruction and drugs. The whole point of it is to be quiet. And it goes on and people say, oh, well, it might be him and all that, but but whatever. So, so to be honest, credit where it's due. And if after all this mayhem, right, we see a new different kind of drug dealing, if you're going to accept it goes on, and it's going to be controlled by people like um, George the Penguin Mitchell, jo you know, John Cunningham, all out of sight, quiet, no, you know, no shootings, no gang warfare. And in places like Dublin and in Ireland, Okay, instead of all the gang warfare that's going on and shootings and all this carry on and rocket launchers and all this crazy mayhem, you get a group with influence like someone like the family who can quiet and everything down and tell all the different gangs, go back to your corners and just do your business quietly. Okay. And the sort of kind of Mr. Flashy and the, the Gucci gang style of... Um, operation is just you know toned down and it's quiet none of this on tiktok and none of this on insta whatsapp and chap snap and all them i don't know what them platforms they do and just quieten it down and no shootings on the street and gangster warfare and all the gangster rap and all that stuff you know if people can put a lid on it and stop all this stuff well yes that's and, you know in my book it's got to be a good thing but make no mistake, right, again, it's all this nonsense about omerta and you must keep your mouth shut. Well, that went out the window in 1980, right, when we 
had the first customs officer killed. Georgie Francis was on that coup. And that's when all the armed robbers and all the uh, criminals started to get into the drug game. And once you get to a certain level in the drug game, you start having to deal with the police, right? For them to give you information, for them to go and get rid of your rivals, so it's a two-way street. And you've got right at the top of the tree, you've got the Kinahans. Now, what they're trying to put out is this, you know, they're wanted, we want them, sanctions, uh, rewards on their head. Well, listen, they could go and lift them any time they want, right? Boom, straight to Ireland in front of the um, non-jury court. I mean, they fuck, they mess the system up. They create the system, the authorities, and, and when needs be, right, they bend the rules, break the rules, or they make up the rules. Okay, so don't be under any illusions, right, that authorities can't go and lift the Kinahans when, you know, any time they want. Of course they can. But the Kinahans have still got MI6 in their corner. And MI6, right, are trying to, there's been a battle go on. Right, between the DEA, the, uh, UFAC, the Treasury Department, okay, and the CIA, right, they're not happy, right, they want to take down the Kinahans, and the MI6 are going, no, they're our assets, so what MI6 have been doing is they've been getting information from the Kinahans and feeding it to the DEA, okay, right, as a pacifier, and to the CIA about the terrorist stuff and all that game as a pacifier, but there's an internal dispute going on. That's why they're still um, um, free. That's why Christopher Kinahan Jr. can go into Rafferty's bar and get drunk out of his mind as if he hasn't got a care in the world. Okay, and that was confirmed to me by someone that happened l uh, last week or the week before. But I also had it confirmed that Christopher Kinahan Jr., right, just days after the sanctions were announced in Dublin on April the 11th, I think it was, 2022, he was in Rafferty's bar, rotten legless drunk. And now it's come through that in the last week or so, he was in there with A. Bulger, rotten legless drunk again, out of his mind, not a care in the world. So there's plenty of blame to be going round, and this is a big game that's being played Okay, right, well, if they're trying to convince the public or convince the crime world that the Kinahans, you know, they're staunch and they would never give information and all that, well, it's going to backfire on them, isn't it? Because all this delay, right, people are going, well, why is it de being delayed? And then we're seeing them all being taken down. They're going down like dominoes. And over the years, we've seen even their partners have been going down. Riddle and Targi, El Rico, Raphael Imperiali. Sergio, right, and then, you know, then you can look around the world, Otinol, even down to people who, um, like Louis Edwards in Spain, Mark Buddle in Northern Cyprus, okay, all of these people, right, well, the Kinahans have got, have got files as long as your arm, it's Christy Kinahan's way of doing things, right, he will have files on every single drug cartel in the world, whether he's had dealings with them or whether he hasn't, because it's just intelligence gathering. In case at some stage you need to use that as a bargaining chip, or in case in some stage you may need to go into business with them, you want to know who they are. You want to know their background. You want to know what they had for breakfast. That's what all these top drug cartels do. And if they don't, right, well, they're asleep at the wheel. And as we know, Christy Kinahan's very meticulous in all that. So, where, whereas initially he's gaining intelligence on every other drug cartel in the world, in case he has to do business with them, so he wants to know who they are and that, well, it's also, he can use that when they're in trouble to feed to law enforcement so they can go and um, disrupt and dismantle that cartel, who may prove to be a rival to the Kinahans. And as I say, you know what I mean? It's, it was all a big plan, and I should tell you all about it. It's a lovely story one day about it was all planned out, right, to concentrate the global drug market, which at the time they were talking about was over $100 billion a year, right? Condense it into one single entity, right, like a big spider in the, middle, in the web of the global drugs business, and once they've got the, uh, the centre of it controlled, they can then control the flow and everything about the drugs cartels. So that's what they were doing. 
And that is still the plan. Although the Kinnahans may be not involved in that because they've been made too public. But going forward, that's what they want. They want one cartel that controls the whole global drugs business. And if authorities have actually got people on the inside, well, they can then, you know, depict which, you know, how much drugs are flowed, how much money's flowed, who's taken down and who's done this, that and the other, because they realise that they're never going to be able to stop the drug business. So what the main thing is, is to control the drug business. And the best way to do that is to concentrate it all the way down, reduce it down into one huge global drug cartel. And we've seen that been happening now. We've even seen, you know, there was even the meeting, right? Well, okay, I'm going to tell you, there was, meant, there was meant to be the big meeting in the Middle East, bringing together the whole global drugs cartels, the triads, right, the Yazooka, right, the Italians, the Moroccans, the South Americans, the North people in the, the United States of America, the Mafia, all the different organised crime groups were coming together for a, for a, for a powwow, for a sit-down in the Middle East, and they were all going to work out the whole global drugs business to be centralised. Anyway, that's another story for another day. But anyway, this one is, um, it's got out of hand. I'll have to do the Panama Papers as another episode, right, because I think we've been rabbiting here for a while. Let's go and have a look. 26 minutes. Okay, I don't want to um, um, do it too long, right? This is going to be um, just about the Kennethons, but also... I just want to reiterate, let's take it back to the top, right, you know what I mean, I want to wish a very, very happy birthday, right, to Paul LeCain, right, and congratulate her and Frank on their 33 years together from Dublin, right, they're my number one listeners, if it's the people I think it is, okay, you know, it's um, it's very heartwarming. But anything you know, anyone with um uh, more than one brain cell really can work all this out. That what I'm saying, I'm not making it up, you know. And if you follow these things, you can see that I mean, law enforcement don't have success after success after success. They even admit they own, they can only stop with all the technology one in ten loads. So if you pass that across, they can only ever arrest one in ten major drug smugglers. Well, recently, right, they've been in, they've been in arresting ten out of ten. <laughs> They're all going down, except the Kennehans. Why? Well, because they've, they've got their MI6 station chief and, and the cover being given. But as I say, there's a battle going on behind the scenes, so we're going to have to see how that turns out. Okay, so this is now going to be our hostage. I think it's 248. Okay, happy birthday, Paula. Okay, and the Kinnahans, okay, what's really happening? They're now, give, they're now giving up loads of, of six tons. So everything's being ratcheted up. Art Hostage signing off. <laughs>